Do we always need machine learning for a data science project? Can we even call it a data science project if there is no machine learning inside? Um, hello, uh, my name is Alexey and I work as a lead data scientist at the OLX Group. And throughout my career, I saw many projects fail. They often fail because they're complex, uh, because the model we use is uh, too complex or because we don't understand uh, uh, the business problem well enough or because the data preparation step takes a lot of time or uh, because the deployment process is too complex. And we often can solve this problem by simply counting. And uh, instead of a complex model, we can start simple by counting things. For example, we can count uh, users and uh, build a recommender system for them and do many, many other things. And uh, if we do that, instead of building a complex model, we can quickly validate our project and see if it brings value. And then, uh, after that, uh, after validating, we can build machine learning model on top of that, uh, but not before. Um, in this talk, we'll quickly go through a machine learning process. How, what are the steps in the machine learning, pro machine learning process and what are the typical difficulties in each step. And then we'll go through examples uh, where we can replace a model, a machine learning model with just counting. There are a couple of examples that I prepared. Um, uh, an example of a recommender system, uh, an example from advertisement for duplicate detection, for fraud detection, and for search. Let's start. So first, uh, let's talk about a machine learning process. Uh, on this, uh, here you see a process called CRISP-DM. So this is a framework for organizing machine learning projects. And it says that in a machine learning project, there are six steps. It all starts from business understanding when we want to define uh, the business problem we want to solve. So we want to understand what is the problem we, we want to solve with machine learning. Um, how we want to solve, how do we measure its success? Uh, what kind of metrics we want to track? How do we see success? Let's say if uh, the project is successful, how does it affect our users? What kind of metric it affects and things like this. So we define a goal here. And then at the next step, we explore the data that we have, see if the, there is some data that is missing, we acquire the data if needed, and then we spend some time preparing data. So this is typical data engineering work. Then uh, once we have the data, we uh, create models, machine learning models, and then we uh, evaluate uh, our solution. We roll it out to a few users and see if actually if the model satisfies the requirements, the business goal we had at the, we have in mind, we had the, in, at the beginning. And we see how well uh, the model does what we want it to do. And at this point, we can decide whether we want to continue with this project or whether we should adjust something or it simply doesn't stand up uh, to our expectation and we need to stop working on this. When we spent a lot of time on uh, modeling, we uh, go to the next step, evaluate the model. And if it happens that the model uh, doesn't satisfy the original goal, doesn't satisfy the original requirements and doesn't move the metric in the direction we want, it's pretty frustrating because often we need to stop working on this project. And to, if we spent a lot of time creating this perfect model that simply doesn't solve our problem, then it's pretty frustrating. That's why first we should try to do it without modeling, try to do it without uh, machine learning, with a simple heuristic, and try to go through the entire loop, through the entire iteration, start with uh, business understanding, uh, start with business understanding, uh, really define the goal, what we want to do, uh, see what kind of data we have, and do a simple heuristic at the next step. And by doing this, we can quickly iterate, we can quickly get feedback if we are solving the right problem, if we are moving in the right direction. And if we are, then we can adjust our uh, business goal, uh, uh, roll it out to the users, already see um, how metrics are affected, and then iteratively improve our solution bit by bit. And uh, perhaps at the next step, uh, adding a simple model and then a more complex model and then a bit, little bit more complex model. Or often, if it's already good enough, we can just stop at that and solve a next business problem. 
yeah, instead of focusing on uh, adding machine learning. And uh, I'll show you a couple of examples how we can do this. So we will first talk about recommender systems. So imagine you have a site, uh, e-commerce website, where you, you are selling different things, like books, uh, movies, uh, electronics, all that kind of things. And you would want to add uh, something on the main page, like uh, um, some items that the users might like. And you're thinking, perhaps I should invest some, uh, some time in building a recommender system. So users, when they go to the website, they see items that they are likely to buy. So something like this. So when they buy, or the, when they come to the website, they see different items and uh, they immediately can click on them and buy something. Instead of building a model um, that will take into account all the taste, uh, tastes, tastes of the user, all the interactions, we can simply show the most popular items. We can just look at what people, uh, what people click on or what people buy and simply show that. Instead of uh, doing it personalized initially, we just show the most popular item across the entire website. Or we can make it a little bit more personalized and make it, for example, per country or per city or per other segment of users. We can add a little bit of personalization, but just show the most popular item. And that's it. We just show it there and we see how it affects our metrics. And we see if the metric we want to uh, to, a, to somehow affect moves in the right direction. So it can be uh, number of uh, items people buy, revenue or time spent on the website, any business metric like that. So if we see if it's uh, moving in the right direction, uh, then uh, our solution is good and we should invest into uh, improving it into perhaps aiding machine learning or just tune in the heuristic a little bit and see how it affects the users. Uh, but perhaps we can do even something simpler instead of uh, iterating on the previous project. Maybe there is something else, something simple we can do uh, to increase uh, our metric again. And imagine when users uh, go to uh, item page. So you see description, title, description, um, uh, things like this, where you can actually buy the item. So you can just add a block. Customers who bought this item also bought something else. That's another recommender system. And again, here, instead of adding machine learning, you can simply, again, count. Just see what are the items that were bought together with this item. Uh, just count all the items group by the, the first item and everything you have there, take top five and present it on the web page. And by that, you can maybe move the metric you care about even higher and have more user engagement, more revenue. And only after that, only after that, you can start adding machine learning. And when you add, it goes to the roof uh, and everybody is happy. Oh, or maybe it's not, and you have a lot of uh, you have a lot of difficulties trying to beat this baseline. Both things can happen, but at least the project you have it already makes uh, user experience better. It already affected uh, the metric positively, and in general, everybody is happy. So now let's consider another example from advertisement. Um, anytime you open an app, you see. Uh, in a, in a net from an app, so something like this. Um, what happens under the hood is uh, the app sends a request to a ad exchange. This is a place where um, that basically gives the ads to apps and other publishers to websites and so on. So the app sends a, a request to the exchange and then exchange sends it to uh, other interested parties, other companies who potentially could be interested in showing an ad to this user. Uh, so they send uh, a request to these interested parties, it's 
uh, they are called DSPs. Uh, the, um, uh, and uh, they have uh, some ads um, and they think, okay, am I interested in this user? Do I want to show them an ad? Uh, and then they make decision. Um, some of them decide, okay, I want to show them an ad and how much I want to pay. Some decide that they don't want to show anything to this user because this user is not interesting for them. And they send uh, their decision to the exchange. And uh, basically exchange uh, selects the, the biggest price and shows this ad to the user. So it happens very fast in a split of a second, like in milliseconds. Um, so you don't even notice um, like the time it takes to, to get an ad. Uh, but under the hood, like a lot of things happen. And there is also some machine learning. So for this, um, for these companies, they need to decide what they actually want to show. And uh, we may need to use machine learning for that. Because how do we decide what is relevant for the user? Um, and um, the time when the app makes a request, it sends a lot of information. So we can use this information to build a model, right? So what they sent, uh, like it's a lot of information, but if we zoom a little bit in, we see that uh, since the, the name of the app, it says the device ID, the ID of this specific device, and the category of the app. So this can be a business app, or if it's a game, it can be the genre of a game, it can be adventure or something like that. Like that. And uh, the exchange, propagates this information to all the other interested, interested parties. So they all get the information that this user uses this app at this time of day, and this user is coming from this country, it uses this kind of device, and this is the ID of this device. So all these companies, exchanges, and all these uh, other companies, they can collect this information in their database and build a profile for each user. So they can just, for each device ID, they can see what are the categories uh, that uh, the user from this device are interested in. Um, perhaps uh, for a user, we saw that this user is really into casual games because we observed uh, them uh, 1,000 times uh, coming from an app uh, or from different apps that have this genre, casual games. Um, this user also likes adventure games because we saw them a uh, hundred times uh, playing some adventure, ga adventure games, but uh, they are not really into business apps uh, because they had only one visit. So we now have some ideas what this user is interested about. Just by observing uh, this traffic, this request coming from the exchange or coming from the app, we can already build a profile. And then based on that, we can decide what the, are the interests of this user and what kind of ad we can show because we can, if we have a casual game uh, that we are advertising, we can just, okay, for this user, they are probably interested in a casual game. So here is a net of a casual game. And we can simply show it to the user. Uh, again, with no machine learning. Um, another example is duplicate detection. So let's say we have, um, again, our e-commerce store, but on this store, users create ads. So any user can come, create an ad, and sell something. So it can be a, like an online classifiers website where users publish what they want to sell. And one user really wants to, uh, to sell their phone. So this user uh, went to the website and published the same ad three times. So we have a duplicate that uh, the same phone appears three times. Uh, what we can do for this to solve this problem is uh, to look at image duplicates. So if, uh, so here we, we see that the image is the same. So internally they can also have the same image. So what we can do is from each image, we can extract uh, an image hash. There are different kinds of hashes. We can uh, calculate a cryptographic hash. So things like MD5, um, but they, even if a single bit of a file changes, a cryptographic hash completely changes. So it's very sensitive. So you see on this picture, we, uh, 
modified the picture a little bit, but the hash, the MD5 hash uh, on the bottle changed completely. But there are other types of hashes. They, they are called perceptual hashes. And they are more resistant to these kind of transformations. So they are affected to a smaller extent to small local modifications like that. And in this example, the perceptual hash that we have here is not changed, it's the same. So we can use this, we can extract hashes from images and simply count them. We can just put everything to a database. So of course we need to, to have a special um, service um, that uh, calculates hashes, but it's pretty simple and there are libraries for calculating hashes. So you can really do this with a couple of uh, Python lines. So it saves hashes to a database and then you simply group by the hash and count how many times it appears. And then if a hash appears two times or more, then it's probably a duplicate and then you need to uh, look uh, to find what is the image where this hash is coming from. So in addition to this query, you will need to, to make a couple of more joints. And then basically uh, you can already see, okay, it's a duplicate or not by simply counting. Oh, of course, there is a, a little extra step because we need to extract hashes, but after that, it's again, simply counting. We can also find near duplicates. Um, so for example, while this um, hash, this perceptual hash is uh, resistant to such small modifications, sometimes they can change a little bit. So maybe in just one, one character here. So one, two, three bits change. And if that happens, then the previous query, this query will no longer work because when we do a group by, we only take into account uh, exact matches. We cannot take into account uh, uh, near same hashes, hashes that are just slightly different. But what we can do is we can take our hash and chunk it into, uh, into small uh, groups. Uh, for example, into chunks of uh, four. Uh, and then we store each chunk separately uh, in a different column, for example. And then we can simply count how many chunks match. And if we see that, for example, three out of four chunks match, then it's probably a very close match. Then we can uh, use uh, something more accurate like humming distance. Um, to calculate how close these hashes are. Uh, but before that, we can find a lot of candidate duplicates by simply chunking the hash and again counting. In addition to images, we can also use this approach for other types of data. So for images, we can use perceptual hashes. For text, we can use uh, other types of uh, locality sensitive hashes like min hash or sim hash. Um, they are locality sensitive because small modifications in texts do not uh, lead to large modifications in hash. So if we change a few words, the hash will probably stay the same. Or we can take any arbitrary vectors um, and uh, also create hashes from them. And vectors can come from images, they can come from text, from pretty much everything. So it can be any arbitrary vector of any dimensionality and then we can just create a hash from this and use the same approach. Just by counting, we can find duplicates. Um, it can also be used uh, to detect fraud. So first of all, uh, since we already know how to, de to detect duplicates, sometimes uh, fraud and duplicates come together. So duplicate uh, listings uh, are sometimes fraud. So we can already uh, tackle fraud from this angle, but we can also do a couple of more things. And for example, again, we have this uh, website, uh, online classifieds website, and there is a seller who posted uh, this ad uh, of a phone. And then as a buyer, I contact the seller and uh, want to get more details uh, and say, I want to buy. But the seller writes, hey, uh, like there are 10 other people who also want to buy this phone. But if you give me $20 deposit, then I'll, um, I'll uh, leave this phone for you. I will not let others have it. So prove your intentions by giving a small deposit 
and this phone will be yours. And when people um, give deposit, um, they, of course, the fraudsters disappear with uh, money. And uh, in many websites, classified websites, there is a report button. So you can report, okay, this seller is suspicious because uh, they are asking me for an advance deposit. They are asking me for money. So you can just say, okay, this um, user is suspicious. You can just press this report button as a buyer. And then um, for a seller, we might keep uh, some sort of seller profile. So we know the ID of this user, IP address where uh, that was used for publishing this ad, signature, like characteristics of browser and things like this. So we can have many things like that. And then when somebody presses a report button, we can just increment count, uh, like a report count for every of these fields, like for user ID, for this IP address, for signature. And when some of these counters exceed certain amount, uh, uh, let's say of trust, so when, for example, it's higher than uh, 10, and we saw 10 suspicious, uh, 10 reports from a certain IP address, um, then we may suspect that this is a fraudster that uses this IP address. Then we can look at uh, all the user IDs that we're uh, publishing ads um, and try to uh, investigate what happens. We can do this by simply counting and we don't need fancy machine learning um, uh, on top of that. And uh, we can solve a real business problem. We can detect fraud by relying on people to report and quickly acting on this. Um, it can also be used in many, many other examples. So for example, if you have a social network and you have users uh, messaging each other, some users may abuse it and send spam. Okay, like, hey, check, uh, I don't know, this link. And uh, if we see if the same message is repeated over and over again, we can just do this by counting. If we see that over the last hour, this message, this exact message was sent uh, 100 times, then it's very suspicious. And uh, we uh, should stop this user from sending more messages. Or if the message is a little bit different every time, maybe one word uh, is different, can be uh, hello name and then the message, then just counting will not work. Uh, because it's uh, not an exact duplicate, then we can just hash it, use uh, things like uh, min hash or other things, or take vectors from these uh, uh, messages and hash them, and then count, vector, uh, count uh, these hashes and find spam messages this way. Or it can be some irregular activity, like many users uh, are registered from the same IP address. Uh, it's probably suspicious. And there are many, many other cases where we can tackle fraud by simply uh, counting things and reacting on these count, counts. Uh, and one last thing, last uh, example uh, is search. Um, so search like uh, you know, when you go to Google, you type something, you have uh, um, a lot of things. Uh, so it uses machine learning, of course to know your preferences. But for many cases, uh, you don't need Google. So let's say you have a simple website um, and on this website, you simply want to add search. You don't need, uh, you don't always need immediately this search to be uh, personalized. You just want to have some search. And that you can also do by simply counting. So imagine you have um, uh, four documents, like uh, one document counting is not heap, then information extraction is the process of something, information gain is used to something, and deep learning is better than counting. We have four documents. And the query we want to, uh, the user wants to execute is information. So user is looking for uh, a keyword information. So we want to find this keyword in this document. So what we can do is just count how many times each keyword appears in uh, these documents and uh, we just take take this text, chunk it into uh, two words and count how many words appears. And for example, uh, the word information appears in document two, 
and document three. Um, and document three, it appears, let's say two times, uh, but in other document, it doesn't appear. So we prefer these two documents. And uh, when we return the results to the user, we just shows, uh, show like this word, um, this document because it has information two times and then the other document because it has information one time. And that's it. So there is uh, nothing fancy. By simply counting, we can find relevant documents. We can um, go one step further and uh, add weighting to each of the terms. Um, it's, uh, the most popular weighting uh, technique is called TFIDF, which stands for Term Frequency Inverse Domain uh, Document Frequency. And then uh, for popular words like not or better or used, um, they have smaller weight. But less popular words um, like things like hip or information or extraction, uh, they have higher weight simply because they occur less frequently. So if the user wants to look for something quite specific, then we want to give these terms more weight. By applying this scheme, we adjust the weights and then we again do the same matching. In general, this uh, technique is called uh, the vector space model and we represent every a document that we have um, has vectors in this space and each word in this uh, space uh, is is its own dimension and then we put a query in the same space and we basically find what is the most similar document to this query. If you uh, don't know much about this, um, so probably you didn't really understand what I'm talking about. So there is a good introduction to information retrieval. So if you're curious about this, um, so there is a good book called Info Introduction to Information Retrieval, go check it out. It has a lot of information about this and uh, quite simple things like just counting and weighting terms. And this uh, type of weighting, um, when we weight uh, things according to the frequency, can be used for other things. So in addition to search, when we give less weight to popular terms like but or used, we can also give less weight in a recommender system for items that are super popular. So maybe for some things, we don't want to show super popular things, but maybe something more niche. Then we can apply this, um, um, this weighting technique and show um, users something that they probably want more or in user profiling. Again, there are some apps that are uh, popular and everybody uses them, like for example, calendar or something else. And, uh, but there are some things that are less popular, um, some specific uh, genres of games, for example. Um, and then uh, by giving them more weight than the popular apps, we can try to find uh, what matches the user interests more than just simply showing what is popular overall. And also for near duplicate detection. Um, so for example, if uh, uh, in case of spam, when user is sending the same uh, spam message over and over again, but they slightly modify it, um, then uh, we can apply weights to some terms and only focus on uh, the uh, not super frequent terms and discard the rest. And by doing this, uh, we will try to make the message look more similar and then it will be easier for us to find other, other duplicates of the same spam message. And we don't need to implement these things. So they, uh, there are tools that implement this. For example, Lucene, Apache Lucene. This is a library for search. And um, there are other libraries that use Lucene, like Apache Solar or Elasticsearch. Uh, that you can just set up and start using it. Uh, and then you don't need to care how it does, how it performs uh, internally. You just set it up and then it does all the counting for you. And then the nice thing about them is first you can get the first iteration by simply counting things. And then once you see that you want to improve uh, them and add a bit of machine learning, they're flexible enough to actually allow you to do this and add some machine learning on top of them. And uh, that's uh, pretty much it. 
So in this uh, talk, we uh, discussed the process, Chris Dem, and the typical step of a machine learning uh, project. And we also discussed that uh, sometimes we can replace the modeling step with something simpler, like a heuristic, like counting. And we talked about examples where um, we can replace a model with uh, a simple uh, counter, like re recommender systems, advertisement, um, duplicate detection, fraud detection, and search. So the key uh, takeaway message from this talk uh, is uh, that it's okay to start without any machine learning. So we need to have um, a business goal in mind and try to start with simple heuristics, for example, by counting things. And then we prove that it's useful. We prove that we indeed can achieve our business goal by doing this and what we are doing is useful for our users. And once we do this, once we prove that we're building something useful, then we can iterate and improve and then eventually add machine learning on top of that. And uh, when you already have counting uh, and you want to add some machine learning uh, on top of that, uh, if you want to learn it, I am writing a book called Machine Learning Bootcamp. Bootcamp. And this book teaches uh, machine learning uh, by projects. So if you're interested in uh, learning more about this topic, um, check the book. Uh, I'm still writing it, it's still in progress, uh, but uh, you can already take a look and decide if it's something interesting for you or not, because chapters are published uh, as I write them. So check it out. And then um, I'll appreciate uh, if you can give me any feedback on the talk. So if something wasn't clear, or maybe some of the things you wanted to uh, to know more about them and I just briefly skipped over them, please um, share some feedback with me. You can do this by um, using this form. Um, and uh, please uh, tell me what you liked about this. You can also uh, win a free copy of uh, my book by leaving your email address in the form. Uh, of course, it's optional. It's up to you. And you can also get the slides of this talk there. And if you have any questions, you can reach out to me on social media or um, find my email on my website. So please do that. And thank you very much for listening.